Hey guys, this is Colin from Blackjack Apprenticeship, and I'm joined by professional sports better, former casino AP, maybe current casino AP. Sometimes. <laughs> and co-founder of Unabated Captain Jack. Thank you for joining me. All right, Colin. I'm looking forward to this. This How you is doing? great. I'm doing okay, man. I this is we're in Las Vegas. And yeah. I think you and I both can relate to Oh, Vegas just wears at your soul. Vegas is still Vegas. But we were here to be at the Blackjack Ball, which was a lot of fun. Yes. And here we are to talk about your backstory. So do you mind giving us a little bit of an idea how you got into Advantage Play? Yeah, you know, well, it was Vegas, actually, that got me into it. The very first time I visited Las Vegas, I I loved the vibe of it all. I was very young. I was like 23. Uh, I loved the vibe of the excitement of the casino. Anything was possible. Wow, you mean I could gamble here and I could I could get an edge at this game blackjack? Uh, so what had happened, my first trip to Vegas, I ended up playing craps with Joe Theismann and Don Shula. No way. Okay, with famous NFL, you know, probably the legendary coach and, and a great quarterback there. And the, I, I love that vibe of it all. Uh, I grew up in New Jersey, so I would go to Atlantic City when I turned 21, and I just was not impressed at all. And after I came back from that first trip to Las Vegas, I got on the internet, which mind you, this is the 90s. So there wasn't Google. It was like yeah. Ask Jeeves or something, right? And I looked up how to beat casinos. I came across card counting. And so very rudimentary card counting information. And then bought some books, Ken Houston's Million Dollar Blackjack, Stanford Wong's Professional Blackjack, and just devoured it. I found BJ21.com, signed up for there. And just took off. And I was a very eager card counter. And it's probably something a lot of people could relate to. I would get just enough bankroll to go to Atlantic City. And I was playing eight deck games. There was no way I was getting an edge with my $300 that I brought. And it was $15 table minimums. So this repeated itself for six to 12 months of me just not making any progress. Because I I was really just looking to get back to Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. And... The whole time, I, I felt that there must be more to this than I'm, that I'm grasping. There must be more to beating casinos. And so I was always thinking, what's next? What is out there next that I could get into? So card counting, yeah, I did a few years of that. But quickly, I moved on to other advantage play techniques. Now, back then, it was a little more limited, but I tried them all. I tried shuffle tracking. I tried... Uh, you know, ace sequencing. I tried hole carding. I tried beating every other game. I tried beating craps for a long time as well. Oh, yeah. Uh, so, dice, dice control? Dice control. Yes. So it, there was always, I've tried it all. And the thing I've learned the whole way through is that it's actually good to try and fail. And that's what I, I've done a lot of trying and failing. But every once in a while, you come across something that's just an angle that hits and it hits right. And, you know, you're away you go. And what was that that hit? Uh, sports betting's been that. Yeah. Um, but before that, internet casinos back in the early 2000s is where I built my bankroll. Okay, okay. So this was the early days. Everything was offshore, and the bonuses were great. I'm sure some of the listeners probably know that right now you can sign up for the regulated sports books and regulated internet casinos in states that have them. And there's a lot of, a lot of uh, EV in the sign-up promotions. Well, back then, offshore... It was the same way, and there was hundreds of casinos. Mm. And so as long as you were comfortable with moving money offshore and getting checks from very bizarre places and uh, getting your bank to question why you have wires coming in from the Caribbean, uh, it was it was great. And so I built my bankroll that way. I built up a, a mid-six-figure bankroll just doing that, and that that's propelled me the rest of my career. Awesome. And... Uh, before getting any further, how'd you get the name Captain Jack? Okay, so that goes back to BJ21. Yeah. I didn't know about aliases, so I signed up for BJ21, which was one of those things where it was $25 a quarter back then. Yeah. And I still had to hem and haul over spending $25. Yeah. And so when I signed up, it said you need to pick an alias. Most people don't use their real name here. And just on the spot, I'm thinking Blackjack, Blackjack, Blackjack. And I was a bit of a Billy Joel fan back then. He's got a song, Captain Jack. I was like, oh, Captain Jack, Black Jack, boom, Captain Jack. It literally was about 15 seconds of thought, yeah. and it stuck with me for 25 years. I think I was Waterman. You were. B BJ21. You were. I don't even think I picked that. I think they picked it for me. I don't, I don't remember how it happened, but right on, and it, and it stuck, Captain Jack. Yep. So you get into sports bang through the online uh, 
casinos Mm -hmm. and the bonuses, like how did that lead you to sports? So it was a natural progression because all of these internet casinos also had an online sports book at the time. And there were promotions for the sports book as well. But with the sports book promotions, I couldn't grind it through at blackjack like I was doing. I was grinding maybe, you know, thousands of hands a day on these blackjack uh, games online to get to fulfill the wagering requirements. With the sports betting, I had to find sports bets. And so I was for a while, I was just trying to take both sides of a game, you know, one here and one there, maybe minus seven and a half here, plus seven and a half there. And just the VIG was four and a half percent, but the bonus was still more than that. Things like that arbitrage. However, I was poking around the sports book one day and I, I still remember this. I came across a prop bet of how many home runs will be hit in each Major League Baseball game that day. And they had the same line for all the games. It was two, two for every game on the board. Well, Wrigley Field, anyone who's even a moderate sports fan knows that it's Chicago, the Windy City. The, if the wind is blowing out at Wrigley Field, there's going to be home runs. So they had the line set at two. I'm like, well, yeah, over two. And then this is the early 2000s. It was still Candlestick Park in San Francisco. And I knew that's the opposite. If the wind is blowing in from the bay, no one's hitting the ball out. And so the line was two. So I bet the under. And so the limit on these bets was $200. But every day I would go in there and I would just check the weather report, which way the wind is blowing at all these stadiums. And Colin, it was fish in a barrel. Wow. Uh, within, within six months or so, that first uh, Major League Baseball season, I was up about 24000 And by middle of the next season, I was up about 40000 And then the sports book got raided and shut down and I never saw the money. No. Yeah. So you, did, you hadn't withdrawn it. I had withdrawn some of it. Uh, I think they ended up taking me for about 28000 total. About 28000 give or take. Yes. I, it was a number that stuck in my head because yeah. there was a— So they actually, they were seized by the U.S. government. This was uh-huh. betonsports.com. Uh, you can Google that story and look it up. The, the owner of the sports book was uh, going from London to Costa Rica, and he had a layover in Dallas— and the U.S. agents seized him in Dallas. Wow. So it was the U.S. government that seized the sports book. And so they promised they would divvy up the funds that were left. Um, I ended up getting paid eight cents on the dollar of the money they owed me. So apparently wow. either they didn't have the funds, they said, or the U.S. government maybe had uh, the cost of acquisition had eaten into the customer funds that were left. But, yeah, that's wow. that was what it was like back then. Yeah, you know, Wild West. That It was the Wild West. And even though, yes, they see they, I lost 28000 there, I was still, I had the, bitten by the bug. I was now finding things online with sports betting. Uh, that wasn't a big part of my bankroll by then, so I didn't really, it didn't sting that bad. Yeah. It actually stings more now thinking about it, you know, that lost 28000 yeah. than it did then. For Back then, it was like just the cost of doing business. Yeah. So I want to go back to the home run over unders. You said it was like fish in a barrel, but I'm sure you still had variants. We, I did, uh, but it was a $200 bet size is all they would take. However, they had like eight different skins, uh, basically other brands that were, they were providing the lines for. So I was betting it that all these places yeah. at the same time. And honestly, compared to some of the, the bets I do now, the variance was very little. Okay. Like it was just, and it was easy money. It was because it was always two. Yeah. Like they never went to, sometimes I think they did two and a half, but even then that was a low number for the wind blowing out of Wrigley. Do you have any idea what your edge was? Well, so that's the thing about sports betting is you can never really exactly quantify your edge. You can quantify it based on my own projection. So I did build a crude model of basically when the weather is this, this is the historical Oh yeah, outcome sure. You can in, back test it. Yeah, and you can find it, it's baseball. There's stats for everything, right? So I could quantify it pretty well with my own model, but that's not like a 52 card deck and blackjack where you know exactly to the hundredth of percent what your edge is so i think i had about a 10 to 20 percent edge on this bet on most of the bets i was making um and when you have that big of an edge and you're really it's not a high variance thing because it's minus it was i think it was minus 120 on either side uh so you you have to basically hit 54 and a half percent in order to break even but it's a very much a, a binomial distribution back and forth it's it's either going to win or lose it's not going to like if you win by six home runs you don't get paid anymore if you if you lose with zero home runs you don't get you don't have to pay more Mm -hmm. sort of like how blackjack is you know if if the dealer beats you with a 21 they don't get three to two so yeah 
So you're interested in sports now, you got the bug. What resources did you use? How did you learn? How did you take it from this seems to make sense and I can look at historic data to being a professional sports better beyond that, that one thing? I was really self-taught. Uh, so Stanford Wong got, I guess, got bit by the sports betting bug as well. You know, Stanford Wong, a great guy because, yes, he wrote all these incredible books about blackjack, but he also wrote about sports betting, about horse racing, about craps, uh, tournament he, play. Tournament. Oh, yeah, tournament play. And I think he had planned to write a book about real estate investing because uh, he had a huge play of real estate in Las Vegas back in the day. But anyway, so he wrote Sharp Sports Betting in 2001, I believe. And like he did with a lot of his other books, he would post the chapters into BJ21 for people to critique and read ahead of time. So I read the whole book before it ever came out, chapter by chapter. And in there, he would give certain ideas. And one of them was this idea of Poisson props. And so in math, there is the Poisson distribution. Now the Poisson distribution, yes, the French word for fish. Uh, the Poisson distribution basically is good for uh, calculating the probability as long as you have things that count up by ones. And so if you have a bet in a basketball game on how many free throws this player will make, well, when you're shooting free throws, they accrue by one. And so you can apply this Poisson distribution and you can say, okay, his average is 3.2 free throws made per game. And the line is three and a half over under free throws. And you can use the Poisson distribution to say, well, if he is averaging 3.2, then that is a 57.3% chance of going under three and a half. And you can do this to all these bets, mm -hmm. such as that home run bet. So I would have this, uh, this crude model and I would project out how many home runs there would be. And then I would apply this Poisson distribution and figure out exactly what that probability was. Now I'm a, I was a card counter at the time. So I'm all into probability. I'm all into like, okay, if I have an exact 57.3% probability, then I know my edge is this, and that's a, you know, 7.2% edge. I will bet 7.2% of my bankroll. Then that's where sports kind of varies, kind of veers away from card counting is you, you can't fully quantify your edge. I'm basing it on my projection. I'm not basing it on a 52 card deck. So yes, it was a, a but that, that was, so getting back to your original question, that was where I started to kind of learn things. I learned from Stanford Wong's book. I learned uh, how to build my own models. I learned uh, how to network with other people and kind of learn what they're doing. And, you know, it wasn't so much like, hey, I'm doing this to beat the NFL. It was like, hey, the NFL is really tough, but I'm over here. I'm betting college football. That's easier. And I go, oh, maybe I should look at college football. It's sort of like that first time when you're networking with other APs and you start to learn they're doing something different. They're playing a different game. And you're like, well, why are they playing that? And then you learn, oh, you can get an edge in that game. I didn't yes. realize that. Yes, absolutely. That happened with us early on where there was this other team playing a certain game. And the way they bet it, we knew there was something else going on. And and so, yeah, led us down that rabbit rabbit trail. So uh, you were talking about the with the Poisson and building models. Was that Excel or how were yes. you? Yes. Okay. Microsoft Excel. I've never been a programmer. Yeah. I've tried. Uh, but Microsoft Excel would make it pretty easy. You could you could build some fantastic things in Excel just knowing how to type in formulas. And then if you add a little VBA scripting in there, you can go a long way in, in Excel. Were there any other resources? It was, it was mostly Wong, his books, networking, figuring it out, and any other resources that, um, or even since then, that, that people would want to know about any... Any specific books, or is it like, no, there's better resources just online now? There are better resources online now. Uh, since then, there's been a couple good books that have been written. The Logic of Sports Betting, which was written by Ed Miller and a professional better named Matthew Davidow. Ed Miller is familiar to a lot of people as a poker writer. He wrote a lot of good poker books. And they really broke it down in an easy way to understand. And when people ask me, how do I get started in sports betting? I say, okay, first thing you do is you read the logic of sports betting. It's probably the best book about explaining all the nuance. So, so if earlier when I said minus 120, if you're like, well, what was that? Go read the logic of sports betting. It's like $10. Yeah. You'll, you know, you'll, you'll learn a whole lot about how sports betting actually works. Awesome. So I know a lot of people that have been card counters, maybe got into other forms of advantage play or didn't. 
and you got into a bunch of things and then sports betting and stuck with that. What do you think it is about your personality or what, what do you feel like led to you ha- having success with this when other people maybe don't bother uh, getting into sports betting? Is it you like it more or is there something specific that can lead certain people to say, yeah, this is a good fit? I think the biggest thing for me was always thinking that there's something else out there. And I still think that way. I still think, what am I going to do next? The things I was doing 10 years ago are not the things I'm doing now. And the things I'm doing now are probably not going to be the things I'm doing 10 years ago when it comes to advantage play. And if you have that drive, if you have that desire to always be trying to figure out what comes next in your career, in your your journey as a as an AP, I think that goes a long way. Why did I grasp onto sports betting? Well, in 2011, uh, I live in New Jersey, and the state decided they wanted to legalize sports betting. And it triggered a long fight that got all the way to the Supreme Court and led to the overturning of a law from 1994 called uh, PASPA, actually, yeah, uh, which is the Professional Amateur Sports Protection Act. And this was this had outlawed sports betting in all but four states in the United States. And basically, the Supreme Court said, no, the federal government cannot pass a law. It's up to the states to decide if they want to have something, which is kind of how casino gambling works. So it makes sense to everyone that's listening. And so in 2011, I said, well, I'm getting sports betting soon. I need to get into this. And so I just started. That was all I was focused on was sports betting. Like I stopped doing as many casino trips. Uh, I stopped looking to learn casino games. I was more just focused on sports betting. And since that fight took about seven years, I had a lot of years of playing with local bookies, playing offshore, networking with other people to get accounts elsewhere. I used to have a friend that lived in Florida, and he was a big poker player. And he would sit at the poker tables in Florida, and there was just bookies all over the place. And so he would get these accounts. He didn't have time to bet sports. He would give them to me. I would bet on the accounts and we'd split the profits Mm -hmm. and it was a good partnership. He'd find the accounts and I'd make money for both of us. Mm -hmm. And so when they finally legalized in New Jersey, I was ready to hit the ground running. And there were some things I didn't realize would be the case in New Jersey. For instance, as a blackjack player would know, you can't get backed off in the casinos in New Jersey. Uh, You can't get backed off from sports betting, but you can get limited. So just like in the casinos, they can say, hey, sir, your, your max bet is $5. In sports betting, they do the same thing. They give you a max bet of even more insulting, like a dollar eighty-four. So you have to. I had to learn to deal with that pretty quickly. You get limited fast if you're uh, have too much of an edge. So, what does a normal day in the life of a professional sports better look like? It's more like a, a normal week, because so for instance, the NFL and college football are probably two of the most popular sports, and they run on a weekly cycle. So you need to know when the lines come out. You need to know when the limits go up at the sports books because then they're going to take a bigger pop. You need to know what information moves a line. Like, for instance, in the NFL, there's a thing called the injury report that comes out for three days during the week, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And you need to look at that injury report because you need to know who's not playing, how much they affect the line, and you need to get to that information fast before all the lines move. And then if you're focusing on props, you need to know how a player's performing, if there's an injury that's affecting his playing time and how much he'll be used more or less. Uh, If you're focusing on something like Wong teasers, which anyone who reads that sharp sports betting, there was another chapter in there called uh, teasers. And he coined the phrase Wong teasers, which are these uh, a teaser is a... (laughs) is a sports bet where you get six extra points for each leg of the teaser. But all the legs of your teaser have to win in order for you to get paid. It's sort of like a parlay bet where you get extra points. And so Wong found that if they move through certain key numbers in the NFL, uh, the three, the six, and the seven in the spread, they become a profitable uh, a bet. And there's been a lot of people that have just focused on this. Well, you need to know when you can bet those Wong teasers. Uh, you know, they're best on game day. And... What you can do with them, so it, it really becomes, Colin, it really becomes a almost a daily grind. Uh, I like to tell people that sports betting will take as much time as you want to give it, and it'll still ask for more. And there are guys I know that do this 18 hours a day. There are guys I know that do this three hours a week. 
It's just a matter of what are you doing with sports betting and what are your expected profits and how much time you're going to devote to it. So I wasn't going to get to this question yet, but, but uh, with what you said, I, one of the people on our forum asked, can you be profitable just doing 10 hours a week? Yes. Yes, you can. In fact, I wrote a recent article uh, for the website that I, I co-founded, unabated.com. I wrote an article about how do you beat sports betting if you just have one hour a day? And I outlined, you know, here are the things you need to focus on. Here are the things you should avoid because you're just not on it enough to get that edge. But if you just have one hour a day here or there, here's what you can focus on. And I think there's a lot of people that look at sports betting as a side hustle. And it's a very viable side hustle right now, especially if you're in a state that has a lot of options. Just like if you were in a state that had a lot of casinos, it's going to be easier to make money uh, playing blackjack with a lot of casinos rather than if you just had one casino where they get to know you and they're like, oh, here comes that guy again. He's not, we're not going to give him a game. Sports books do the same thing. So if you only have one sports book, legal sports book in your state, you're going to wear out your welcome or you're going to find that they're not as beatable. But if you have 20 sports books in your state, you can just sit there and look around for all the inefficiencies in the market when there's opportunities. And so it's a more viable side hustle the more options you have. So were you betting multiple sports year round or would you kind of have your busy season and then a opportunity to slow down part of the year? So when I first started, I, you know, I had those baseball props, those home run props I talked about. And when baseball season was winding down, I said, okay, let me see what comes next here. And the NBA started up a few weeks later, and I noticed they had props on how many f uh, fast break points and points in the paint that would be in each NBA game. And I approached it the same way. A smaller team is going to run faster. They're going to have more fast break points where a team that has a big center, like maybe Shaquille O'Neal, he was still playing back then, uh, they're going to get a lot of points in the paint because he kind of dominates in the paint. And it seems they were pricing it again, just just based on like the league average for each game. They had the same line for each for each game. So I did the same thing. I built this crude model that said, okay, well, the Lakers with Shaquille O'Neal, they average this many points in the paint, especially if they're going to go up against a team with another dominant center, uh, whereas a team that might be smaller might try to outrun Shaquille. And so when they play this team, that team's going to have more fast break points and modeled it out that way. So that kind of led me to being a basketball better. And I would do baseball all summer. And then I would do basketball from roughly October through April, June, you know, playoff time. And then I get back to baseball. So kind of all interconnected. Uh, however, in more recent years, what I do now is I, I practice more of what's called a top down method. And what this is, is less about handicapping. It's less about building models. It's about finding the sharp sources in the sports marketplace and then finding the weak sources and saying well okay if this book has the line at at minus three on this nfl game and there's a book over here that has minus two and a half and i know that this book the first book is sharp super sharp and i know the second book is DraftKings or bet mgm and they're not as sharp i know well that minus two and a half that's the weak number the sharp number is the strong number and i go bet it at the weak place and you just rinse and repeat that all over the place find your edges that way. And now it's not so much about understanding, you know, which teams have a dominant center and all that. It's just about numbers. You know, it's just, I'm just playing numbers. I'm just looking at odd screens and I'm saying, okay, there's the weak books. They have an inefficient line. Let's hit that line as hard as we can. And then let's find the next one. And are you doing that year round then? Yes. Cause that you can do in any sport. It's the same process. It's just, you apply it to each sport. As long as you know what makes up the sharp and the square books within each sport and how to spot those inefficiencies. And that was when we started unabated, that was one of the things I wanted to build was the ability to help people spot the inefficiencies in the market, not because it'll make those inefficiencies evaporate faster, but it'll train people to now know, okay, I don't need to know all the intricacies of every sport. I just need to know that six and a half percent is a good edge and I need to find that. And I need to know that that is a, a six and a half percent edge. Let me go bet that. It's all about, it's all about numbers now. And it really, I don't, I don't watch a lot of sports at all. I just, I just watch markets and I just pick off inefficiencies. Do you pick a certain amount of hours you want to work on it or how do you, how do you determine how much? Cause there's always, there's always, like you said, it could take all you want and more. Yes. Uh, I try to I try to limit the hours I devote to it. 
I do more in kind of running the site now. That's, that is my main job at this point. I still like to bet sports and I still like to find those inefficiencies, but some days I just don't have the time. And I, I make it a point not to try to go down that, that trail and try to find inefficiencies. It's only going to eat up the rest of my day. So, uh, I try to take one to two days completely off from betting now per week, per month, per week, per week. Yeah. And it used to be, I would take one day off a month if that now I, I definitely try to take two, and especially in the summer, look right in the summer, you have baseball and baseball is a hard sport to bet because there's 15 to 16 games per day and you can grind all these edges and you can stare at the screen and it'll just, it'll just waste your summer. So I always tell people, I'm like, don't, don't miss taking your summers off. It's, it's really worth get out in the, in the good weather. If there's good weather where you are in the summer and, and enjoy that and get back for football and basketball. Cause that's where you're going to make a lot of your money anyway. So going back to the advantage play stuff, was there something about that lifestyle that made you want to move on from certain advantage play opportunities? You know, with each thing I've tried and especially the things that I failed at, there's been a reason I've failed where other people have succeeded. So let's take card counting. I failed at card counting because I just wasn't disciplined enough. Uh, I was often, you know, if I lost the count midway through the shoe, I may, I may play through it. Or uh, if I knew the game was not was was only t- barely good, I would still play all rather than Wong in and out. Uh, so discipline things. With a lot of other casino AP plays, I didn't like the travel. I I used to have this play where I was flying across country at least once a month, and I was only staying in this other state for 24 to 36 hours, and then I was flying all the way back across country. And I just really dreaded those. And I had to do the trip once a month. And I just really dreaded that. And it just, I was just like, ah, I wish I could just could stay home and do something. And sports betting allows you to do it from home if you live in a, a good place for sports betting. It allows you to get away from the travel. And once you stop that travel, you really, you really hate to do it again. It's one of those things where anytime you do something and you find something better, you just dread doing that old thing. It's sort of like how I started tonight, today and I said, oh, I dread being in Vegas. And then I talked about how much I loved Vegas when I first started. Well, I did, and now I hate it. And part of the reason I hate it now is because I did it so much that it just became not likable to me anymore. Yeah, a lot of people get into card counting for the travel. Yeah. But then it, when you've gotten that, when you've done that a couple of years, you might say, hey, I, I don't want to travel anymore. So with card counting, the biggest odds you hit is three to two. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the The biggest payout jackpot, you know, unless you're doing some side bet or, or, or whatever. Um, but with sports, are there any like crazy long odds that you've, you've hit? And you tell us a story of, of anything where, or what's the longest odds you can think of that, that you bet and hit? So I used to do this play in Delaware from 2009 to 2018. They had parlay cards. Now a parlay card is very simple. It's a pre-printed card with the lines for that week's NFL games and you pick against the spread and you but you have to make a parlay and a parlay of course is multiple bets that all have to win in order for you to get paid and they have longer odds and as parlays go these parlay cards were not good because whereas a, a parlay the true odds were like seven to one and most sports books will give you six to one these parlay cards were giving you five and a half to one and anyone who's you know mathematically minded would go, well, that is a negative 11.9% edge or whatever. you know. Well, here's the trick, Colin. They had to print these cards on, they had to send these to the printers on Sunday night in order to get them by Wednesday. Now, that's the difference between Las Vegas and Delaware. Because in Las Vegas, it's a 24-hour town, so they can set these lines on Wednesday and get the cards out like same day. But in Delaware, where they didn't have as many... Um, vendors or resources or printers they had to set these lines on sunday and then get these cards just to get out by wednesday well now you have lines that were set on sunday and i can bet them all the way up to the following sunday and in that time you know a quarterback might be out there might be news or information or injury information that doesn't get factored into these pre-printed lines so these are stale numbers okay so i've set this up two minutes to set up this thing of I could go in there and I could bet all these parlay cards and I could round robin everything. So I built a little Excel spreadsheet and I could run all what the lines were currently on a Sunday morning, the day of game, 
and then what I'm betting into as these stale lines and then figure out what kind of edge I have on each of these bets. And some weeks I would have eight to 10 different games and the minimum I could do was a three team parlay and then I could round robin it. So I, if like I have teams A, B, C, D, I would have a parlays of A, B, C, A, B, D, B, C, D. You get the point, right? You're round robining all the permutations. Permutation, I just should have said that. So I would make all of these bets and there was a little bit of art of sports betting involved there where I had kind of buddied up with the management of this Delaware casino, um, Delaware Park. And so they were allowing me to freely bet whereas other sharps were getting limited. But what happened is some weeks I would have you know, twenty, thirty thousand dollars invested here, and if everything hit, it was a, it was a good six-figure score. Uh, now I did this for eight or nine years, and twice we we hit everything. We you know all I think one time it was seven teams, the other time it was eight teams. Everything won, wow. multiple hundred thousand dollar payout. Um, now there were plenty of weeks, Colin, where. Yeah. Uh, you know, you had eight teams and only two of them won. And since it's three team parlays, you just went zero and 56 um, with all these bets, which, you know, lost tens of thousands as well. So it, it swung both ways. But those parlay cards, man, that was huge EV, huge payouts. And you just had to sweat out. And, the, you know, the NFL is only 18 weeks a year. So you had to kind of hope that maybe this year we're going to get a, you know, an eight no week. Um we were profitable every single year we, we played down in Delaware. It was a very good play for us. That's an awesome story. So with card counting, we know that the law is on our side. Maybe returning to a casino that's trespassed you is a different story. But for sports betting, what do people need to know about the legality of it? Okay, so the first thing is there are currently 35 states that have legalized sports betting, regulated sports betting in some way. And if it's in your state, good. Not all states are good setups, though. There are certain states where they've just given it to the lottery, and the lottery says, okay, well, we just want one vendor. And, you know, that's all the options you have for sports betting. Oregon comes to mind. Washington, D.C. comes to mind. Uh, Delaware is actually not great for sports betting. Rhode Island's not great. And then you have states where they've said, okay, well, we'll build a gaming commission, and we'll let this be a capitalistic society where, uh, you know, we can have this many licenses available for, for people. So... In states like New Jersey, Colorado, they have more than 20 different sports books available. And you have this regulator, which makes sure everything gets, stays safe. You're always going to get paid. Uh, no sports book is going to go under and, and take your money like happened to me back in the early days. With the, the state regulator there, they guarantee that the funds are, are there for the players. Uh, however, then you have the states where it's not legal yet. And so your only option is to bet with a local bookie, which of course is not legal for them to book your action. There's only two states, and sorry that Washington is one of them, where actually placing a bet is illegal. Uh, the other is actually Nevada. If you, are, if you are betting with an illegal bookie or betting offshore in Nevada, you're technically committing a misdemeanor. misdemeanor. In Washington state, it's a felony to uh, wager offshore. Which is why we never, like we talked about it on our early blackjack team, you know, even the online poker boom, it, it was like it wasn't worth the risk with what we were making card counting to because it was kind of a gray area for sure. And then it became actually they said, yep, this will be a felony. It was like, yeah, not worth it. It's a little ridiculous to to have it be a felony. Now, you do have tribal sports betting up there, but it's all in person. You can't use an app. So it's really arduous to go to drive to all the tribal casinos. Uh, so if you're in a state that you're betting with a local or you're betting offshore, you're technically not committing a crime. The 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 way the law is termed, it is the business of sports betting that is illegal, and the business is accepting a wager and charging a VIG for that wager. That's actually the business. So technically, you'll never be charged with anything in most states uh, for betting. You don't have to worry about that. However, you do have to worry about, like, are they going to stiff me? Are they not going to give me the money? Uh, most of the bigger offshore places are probably more solid than any regulated place in terms of the amount of money they have and the the reputation they have is, is very solid. Some of the more smaller ones you don't know about. And then, of course, your local bookie. Sometimes it's just a college student that thinks he's found a good way to make money. If he runs into a sharp better, uh, you know, he, he'll feel like 
you're the cheater, uh, even though he's the one that's committing something illegal. So, yeah, it's it's a mixed bag when it comes to betting anywhere that's not in a regulated state. And how do you feel about the sports betting landscape now compared to 10 years ago? For In many ways, it's better. In many ways, just because there is now this sense of confidence that you can go about and do this and you know you're going to get paid. And the regulated books have brought in a lot of innovative ways to bet on sports, which I think is very good for the consumer. In any kind of capitalistic society, innovation is what separates one company, one operator from another. And some of them realize this and they've tried to innovate more than their competitors. And I think that's great for the consumer. In some ways though, it's, it's broken down to this dichotomy of you have sharp sports books and you have recreational sports books and the recreational sports books are the one names, you know, DraftKings, FanDuel, BetMGM, PointsBet, so on. They exist just for entertainment purposes only. And if anyone tries to beat them, they're so offended by that. How, how, how dare you try to come in and win, even though they're doing all these commercials on TV that say, come on in and win, change your life. You're going to win a lot of money. Yeah. On podcasts too, it's, it's constant. Right. Yet when you go in and you try to win, that's when they say, no, sir, you can only bet $1.84 on the NFL, which is almost insulting. Uh, it goes against the, a very American feeling of if you tell me that the sky's the limit, then the sky better be the limit. Don't put a glass ceiling up in front of me. That's, it's, so, it's just so un-American. It really is. And what happened is these are a lot of European bookmakers where it's been legal for decades over there, and they were ready. When the U.S. legalized, they rushed right in. The Las Vegas casinos were not ready. They, were not, they could not scale up their operation into multiple states. They, they're still lagging behind. And so that's why all these other companies came in and ate their lunch. And these other companies are largely these recreational sports books. Now, anytime you have, what's the saying? Like in a, in a world of blind people, the, one, the one-eyed man is king, okay? Well, that's sort of like what it is with sports betting because now we have these sharp sports books and people are starting to realize that these recreational sports books are not quite what they pretend to be. And people that want to really wager money on sports betting, sharp or not sharp, want to not run into these hurdles and these roadblocks. And these sharp sports books are willing to take any all comers. Uh, Circa here in Las Vegas is a good example of one. There's a new one called Prime Sportsbook that is out there, and uh, they'll take bets from anyone. And there's a few others that'll take. Caesars actually takes a decent bet as well. And what happens is. People start to gravitate toward these sharp ones because in a capitalistic society, innovation is key. And this is innovation now to have a sports book that actually takes your your wager. And so there's hope that there will be some sort of um, wave of sharp sports betting that comes along in the operator side to help counterbalance the recreational um, sports books that are just, you know, paper tigers. So do the sharp sports books back people off at all? They do not. And the reason they do not is because they can use your information. Okay, so look, here's an example. DraftKings backs me off. I'm no longer betting at DraftKings. I'm a sharp better. Now, if I bet, the sportsbook can say, well, Jack's betting this. What does he know? Let's adjust our line because we know Jack is usually winning. So we'll we'll move the line so that it's uh, more towards what he thinks it should be. Whereas the the square books that don't that that don't take my action, they'll, they'll never get that information. Now, here's the, the thing, Colin, is I'm still betting at DraftKings. I'm just betting through other people. I'm just having other people put the bets down. And so they're, they're still taking my money. They're still paying me. It's, they're not getting the information. And a book like Circa, they understand that. And they go, you know, we would rather lose a little bit of EV to Jack and be able to adjust our line properly from him rather than have Jack be betting through his buddy Colin. And, uh, you know, we don't, we don't know that that's sharp action. So it's an information game. And that's what I'm selling to Circa when I bet there is I'm selling them a little bit of information in return for the EV. And that's what these other sports books aren't getting. Now, how do those other sports books operate? Well, they just look at the rest of the market and they react to the rest of the market. And if you go back about 10 minutes in what we were talking about, and I'm talking about how I look at the sharp sports books and I bet it at the slower sports books to move. Well, that's like the DraftKings. They're looking to Circa and see what they make the line and so if Circa moves and I can catch it at DraftKings before it moves, boom, that's some value. Outside of scalability, uh, 
Over your career, what have you enjoyed playing the most? For a long time, I was uh, beating casinos with promotions. Now, that doesn't seem like so far-fetched today. But when I first started, I don't think people realized what was out there in marketing and how much you could exploit the marketing departments. And for the longest time, marketing departments and casino operations did not talk to each other. And so you could... Uh, you could get a marketing department to just give you the world and casino operations never knew you were going to be in the building that you were there, you know, and if you, if you knew the right machines to play that maybe had a theoretical that was set wrong, uh, you could look like you're betting very square and you have a tremendous edge, especially if you can monetize some of the comps. Uh, and I have this, I have this one story I've never told, uh, and it's, it's a doozy. So I had back in the day, I had a casino that would send me a book of coupons every month, uh, that were worth about $15,000 a month. And they required me to go into the casino, ah, it's like 15 or 20 times during the month. And the coupon had a little code on it that I would need to enter in when I would put my card in, I'd enter my pin. And then I had to enter this coupon code to get my, uh, like 500 or $700 for each visit. And one month, for a very specific reason, I did not receive the mail um, because I had to use a, a different address. And so I never got this book. I didn't get the mail, but I really wanted this $15,000 or so over the course of the month. And I knew that there was going to be three months of this. So really, it was like $45,000 we're talking about, which is, which is worth enough that I decided to go in and just guess the number. Now, they only locked your account if you guessed wrong three times. So I could get two guesses, and if I was still wrong, I'd go to another machine, I'd put my card in, and do it again, two guesses. What's the worst that could happen? I would only have to guess a 1,000 numbers. Um, not On guess number 992, I got the number. No. Yes, 992 hours. And it, it got to the point that I was like around 500 I wanted to give up, around 700. I'm like, did I skip a number somewhere? Yes, so on guess number 992. Now, the best part about this story the following month, I had to do this again, and I got it on guest number three. <laughs> so overall, I ran, I ran ahead of EV in terms of the number of guesses I should have had to use. Um, and by the way, the, the numbers were, uh, during the month, There was you, you could figure out the interval between numbers. So once I had the, the seed number, I could get all the numbers the rest of the month, but each month started with a new random three-digit number. So uh, yes, so 992 guesses the first time, three guesses the second time. Uh, still ahead of EV. Oh, that's hilarious. Let's say I'm in an area with 10 sports books. What is my potential for a career there? Am I going to be burned out within a couple months? Am I going to be able to do that forever? It depends. So this is a good time to mention this phrase that I use often, which is there's the science of sports betting and the art of sports betting. And full credit to Richard Munchkin, who used to say this about everything about blackjack and the science is fairly well known. The art is actually getting the money down. And same is true with sports betting, especially if you want to try to make a living at these recreational sports books, which are very beatable, but they're going to catch on to you sooner or later. And you can do things to kind of throw them off your scent. For instance, a lot of them will profile you just based on your first 10 to 20 bets. And so you can make your first 10 to 20 bets be very square, not sharp, and maybe throw them off your scent for a while. Uh, but anytime you have multiple sports books in a state, you really have multiple opportunities. And you also have friends and family. And sometimes uh, if you just you know partner up with a, a friend or, or family member and say, hey, look, I'll tell you what you go bet and we'll split the profits or whatever, uh, that can be the best way to kind of get longevity and overcome the you know, the, the limits that sports books inevitably get on you. Is there a number you would say is kind of the minimum number needed to be worth pursuing sports betting? It, honestly, you can't have too many sports book accounts. So even if you are in a state where there might only be a single regulated sports book or just two or three, they're still offshore. You know, there's still local people that you can go through. There's, and I realize for some people that's a bridge that they don't want to cross but if you're really interested in it, eventually you realize that, okay, I do need to continue to expand my world. We call it outs. You can never have too many outs. And that may include offshore. That may include some local bookies. 
but really, I, I can't think of a minimum and I can't think of a maximum. It's as many as you can. And how does Unabated help people betting sports? So Unabated at its root is a site where we teach, uh, we, have, we have tools and resources to help people understand sports betting better. I don't like to spoon feed people anything, okay? I've, I've grown up, I, we talked about it. I went through all this process of learning how to be a card counter, how to be a hole carter, how to be a shuffle tracker, how to be a sports better. And so I don't want to betray the craft, and I want to, but I want to help people get there. And so we have these tools and resources that maybe are beyond what your current skill level is, but they'll help you continually to level up. And at the core of Unabated is our odd screen. So just like I mentioned how you stare at that screen and you find edges, well, we have an odd screen that has 30 or so of the top sports books in the world, both ones you can bet at in the United States, the DraftKings, the FanDuel's, BetMGM, as well as ones that are offshore that are, that are purely signal. They're the, the bookmaker and pinnacle and places like this that are sharp sports books. They've been sharp for decades. And you can use them as your signal to find where the lines are off at the more recreational books in the U.S. And then we've also kind of built these overlays onto this odd screen so you can quantify your edge more easily. So you can see that, okay, this line at DraftKings has a 3.2% edge, and you can go from there. Now, you're using, you're using your trust in us and what we think the line should be based on the sharp sports books, but at least you're getting... 85% of the way there in terms of your knowledge about the differences between lines. And that's helping people kind of level up their game from where they would be if they were just coming into this fresh and new uh, versus using our tools to kind of get a leg up. And But our site goes way beyond that. Our site goes into calculators and into simulators and into modeling and all these things. So whichever way you go as a sports better, we have some tools and resources that'll get you a little bit further faster. I know a lot of very smart, successful bettors are using it. And so they, if they're trusting it, it sounds reputable. I think for people coming from card counting, Blackjack Apprenticeship kind of does completely walk you through the path. People are gonna have to be willing to do some work on their own to, to figure it out, but everything's there uh, for, people that want to be sports books. So thanks for sharing with us how you got here and uh, how you went from one thing to the next to something that really landed for you and for what Unabated can help people with. And for more about professional sports betting, check out the Unabated YouTube channel.